Welcome back to the channel. I'll be covering Palantir Valuation today. Before we proceed, please be reminded that this is for educational purpose only. Do not treat this as any form of advice. The numbers you see on the Excel are for illustration of valuation concepts. You must always do your own due diligence. This is a relative valuation model which means using competitors to price Palantir. I believe you commonly heard about DCF, Discounted Cash Flow Model. That is more of an absolute value model. Yeah, look at it as its own company runway or free cash flow and discount them back to present value or intrinsic value. It does not make references to how its industry peers are priced, unlike this relative valuation model. In a previous video that I done for C Limited, I did a sum of the parts model using C as example. How is that different from here? The similarity is both uses relative valuation concept. The difference is that C Limited was priced on three different multiples that are price to GMB, price to sales, and price to EBITDA. That's a more complicated model as C Limited has three different businesses at different corporate life cycle stage. So what we have here for Planetary is just using price to sales multiple. The second difference is that the C example was a one year forward valuation model, whereas it's for a ho longer horizon up to 2025. Some prefer using a longer horizon one as stock price may not be priced efficiently in the short term and need time for market to realize the true value. This pretty much depends on your ho investing horizon and you can tweak the model accordingly as you see fit. I have put the link to the C valuation model in the description below if you're keen to check out. Moving on to the model for Palantir, there are four steps to this exercise. So you have to actually project the growth rates, share dilution, price multiple, and conduct a scenario analysis. What you see on the screen is the valuation model itself. The, the yellow fields are actually re those that require your input or assumptions. In order to decide what variables to insert here, I have suggested some data points that you can consider on the right. You can't see them now, the full details, but I will scroll over and provide explanation in a short while. So let's dive down into step one. Uh, right here, we have to project the revenue growth rate. Palantir has two distinct business in government and commercial. We have to separate them as they are in a different growth trajectory and also different life cycle stage. The government business has been around for 17 years, while the commercial one only took off recently. For simplicity, you can also just project the top line here and remove and disregard the business verticals. Scrolling to the right, there are multiple dimensions to look at here. First would be management guidance. Alex Cobb, CEO, mentioned that 30% growth is the target till 2025, so let's, let's keep this number in mind. Secondly, quarterly trending rates are actually good indicators of momentum. You can see that the government business has actually trended down and the growth rate has collapsed to 26%. This looks bad on the surface, but you have to dig for more information. Cup mentioned in the Q4 earnings call that budget delays resulted in new deals not being signed, although they may have been won. He said government business is unlikely to decelerate from its long-term baseline of 30%. Of course, there will be fluctuations and lumpiness in revenue along the way. COO Sean Sereng Senka reiterated the same in a recent interview by Morgan Stanley. You can see the earnings transcript and the interview that I put in the description below. I want to stress that one has to dig deeper to make sense of the trends and decide for yourself what's a good forward assumption to make. In this case, I will go along with 25% growth rate as by assuming that CUP misses the target slightly of 30% by a bit just to be on the conservative side. We have to watch closely if government business growth rates actually does rebound in the next few quarters to validate what management has told us. For this commercial side, I think it's a nice trend upwards. Alex Cup shared that they have ramped up the sales headcount, which explains the 47% growth in Q4, and that is mainly driven by US commercial. He sounded very optimistic at this Q4 numbers were achieved, with majority of the sales force being hired near the end of 2021, which means they have yet to settle in and truly ramp up. For all the positive that we have, I will only assume a 30% growth rate, which is a long-term guidance as I am taking a multi-year view, and sustaining a a 50%, near to 50% growth over the long term may be a challenge. So let's head back now. And as mentioned, we will assume 25% for government and 30% for the commercial side. 
So you can see here that after key penciling our assumption, uh, it works out to a revenue of four billion come 2025, and that implies a 27% growth rate. If you remember just now, we mentioned that uh, management guide the guided for 30%, so there's a leeway or rather a margin of safety of 3% for the, for management to miss their guidance. So the next thing we have to do is to make makes a sense check of the market share. So moving back to the right again. The annual report actually provides us with the total addressable market, or TAM, which is about 119 billion. So this works means our growth assumptions have plenty acquiring a 3% market share. I believe this 3% is a very reasonable, reasonable number and probably indicate a long-term growth ahead. If your market share turns out to be a large number, like let's say above 50%, you may have to reconsider to re revise your growth rates as it may be an as aggressive assumption. So right now we are good with the growth rates that we have assumed here, 25 and 30 respectively. Next will be share dilution. This is a very common topic for Palantir investors. So right now when I move to the right, Right here you see the quarter to quarter trending of the share count. A large jump actually uh, was observed, he observed here near the end of Q3 2020 when Palantir made a direct listing. Shares had to be awarded to staff who have stayed with the company for many years and share compensation is continued to be used to attract and retain the best talents. A relatively small company like Palantir may not be able to compete on cash salary with big tech firms. Many are concerned that existing shareholders may be diluted as a result. On this end, Cup mentioned uh, in the Q4 call that stock-based compensation will normalize in the next two to three years. We have already started to see the increase in share count growth coming down to 2% in the latest quarter. I will assume 5% here to be conservative. So moving back, I'll just key in the 5% here. The third step is to project and pass it in the multiple. So right here, right, I have put in the comparable companies that are of the same, relatively similar industry. This is a very subjective exercise, so please choose your own companies and variables to put into the model. I think S Snowflake and C3 AI are pretty close. Uh, do note I use management adjusted operating margin numbers here. For Snowflake, it's actually more on the data data lake side and not so much on AI. The growth rate is actually three times that of Palantir and interestingly enough, the price to sales ratio is also three times. C3 AI is closer to Palantir, uh, given that it's in the AI space. But according to Morningstar, the growth rate is actually trend down, so that may explain why the relatively lower multiple of nine. I'm not very familiar with this company, so do check out if you want to find out more details. So you can see, all in all, the operating margins across these three companies are actually not that comparable because they are in different stage of growth. And but we can see that the, the we can see a range of nine to fifteen multiples, price to sales multiples here. If you move on to the further right, those are the more mature sales companies out there. These can be good indicators as to how Palantir may be priced as it matures. Adobe and Microsoft have near to Palantir operating margin but half the growth rates and yet having the same range of price multiples of 10 to 15. I'm not very sure about what's happening here between ServiceNow and SalesWall as I expected their multiples to be closer to each other than they are now. I added them for your thoughts as they are new age SaaS companies but more matured than Palantir, Snowflake and C3i. So from these numbers, I will actually look to pencil in a multiple of 12, which is the average between these two. And also means a slight compression of multiple from the current of near to 15. Do note that Palantir multiple used to be in the 20s before growth stocks actually corrected in share price. So 12 does seem reasonable when Palantir grows to a larger scale and will probably slow down in growth come 2025. So now let's input the price to sales multiple of 12 here. So we are done with the model itself. So using all these numbers that we have penciled in, right, we can see that the intrinsic value in 2025 works out to 24.13. So this basically means that if the variables come through, that will be a 22% annual return when the share price reaches 24.13 from 11.39. So how do I get that number? You, you have to key in the, the intrinsic value from here and input here. Yep, 
Yep. So this is where how you get the twenty two percent, assuming all your waivers come true. Then this is the return you will get from the increase of sh from buying a share at eleven thirty nine cents, and when it materials and realizes again up to twenty four point one three come twenty twenty five. So basically, this is like this table is like a summary. Uh, the aim is to project the Kager return, assuming you start investing at the any share price that you can want to key in here, and you evaluate yourself at the end of 2025. You can of course uh, tweak the dates accordingly to, to your preference. Uh, and right here, I'll just show you how the, ex how the formula works. It actually takes into account of the ad start date and end date of your investment, and the start price and end price. Start meaning the, the buying price that you have, and end will be a projected number, which may or may not come true. Let's say if it's come true, then... But valuation is never an absolute number, but a range. We ne so therefore, we need to have a worst case, base case, and base best case scenario. Right here, we can tweak the growth rates and price to see what we show to see the impact of on the Kager returns. So these are the numbers that I choose, but feel free to use your own. For gone business, I think it can grow thirty percent in the best case since it has been running for many years, and worst case at fifteen percent, which is a ballpark number looking at the recent growth trends. Commercial will be a bigger uh, revenue driver, so I pencil in a high 40% in the best case and 25% uh, if it fails to meet expectations. So, all these numbers actually centered around the measurement guidance of 30% growth or the base case that you see here. So, once you're done with the scenarios that you plan out here, right, you have to key the numbers in the above model to obtain the intrinsic value at here. So, let me just show you what I, what I will be doing. So right now I'll start with the worst case. I'll change to 15, 25, and 10. So that means 15.68, I'll key it here. And I'll repeat for the best case. 30, 40, and 15. 37.7. So there you have the intrinsic value and projected Kagan return in the three scenarios which will be useful to helping you to form your a range of expectations. Before we, we end, I want to reiterate that evaluation is secondary to company quality. You must first be convinced that a company is good, is something you want to own for its qualities before thinking about valuation. After all, cheap can get cheaper especially in today's climate, so conviction is key. Wherever we see stock price fluctuate, fear will come in and we might just throw the valuation model out of the window. So this is when you need to be really believe in the numbers that you have keyed in into the Excel sheet. If not, the Excel sheet will just be numbers. So one really needs to do more homework to understand the mean meaning behind these figures. You have to use assumptions and projections that you're most confident of. A long-term view is also needed for valuation to play out. Always do your own due diligence. Appreciate your time for listening. I'll be very grateful you can like and subscribe to encourage me to do more videos. Thank you.